you ever been hesitant about asking for something? Have you been ever you are hesitant for asking or asking somebody for something? Most people have. This is because we are afraid of being a liability or a pest, if you may say. If we are faced with asking over and over again, this is not the case with God. The Lord wants us to ask for everything. Sad to say we go to God and ask if we are bother if if we are bothering him or this is going to put him out. This is a serious problem that prevents us from getting the true benefit of prayer through petition. So we find it very deep because we think we are bothering God. We are somehow he's See, God is not bothered. He can, answer the, he can answer all the prayers of the world at the same time. You see, he's not limited. He can do it all at the same time. He is not bothered by you asking. James chapter 4 verse 2 teaches us that we have not, that you have not because you ask not. How many things that we should have had had today, we don't have it because we did not ask. And so James said, you have not because you did not ask. God wants us to ask. To pray without asking is not praying at all. God wants us to ask. To pray without asking is to denying God's power to supply all our needs according to his riches in glory. God wants us to ask. Eh? God wants you to ask. And so what happened is that prayer has become a very, very, uh, it, it, prayer is not the very, it, in the church, people don't want to go to prayer meetings. Not only our church, but the body of Christ worldwide. Of course, in some places, in other parts of the world, I hear that people, prayer is where people want to go. And thank God for that. How about in Canada? What about Well Springs Victory Church? Going to a prayer meeting because we want to pray. Amen? Let's read another scripture in Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11, verse 5 to 13. And if our church is going to be known for something, it might as well be that we are people who pray. <laughs> as you go to that church, those people, they really do pray. Can somebody say amen? So Luke chapter 11, and I'm going to be reading from verse 5. Then teaching them more about prayer, he used this story. Suppose you went to a friend's house at midnight wanting to borrow three loaves of bread. You say to him, a friend of mine has just arrived for a visit and I have nothing for him to eat. And suppose he calls out from his bedroom, don't bother me, the door is locked for the night. And my family and I are all in bed. I can't help you. This looked like a phone call from Africa. <laughs> uh, African friends there. It always happens when 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock when you're really catching your sleep. And then you look at it, should I answer or no? Hey, eh? <laughs> This story reminds me that a phone call where you don't least expect. Hey, eh? They're asking for you to answer, but you don't know. He said, don't bother me. The door is locked for the night, and my family and I are all in bed. I can't help you, but I tell you this. Though he won't do it for a friend's friendship's sake, if you keep knocking long enough, he will get up and give you whatever you need because of your shameless persistence. Can you see the persistent there, the story of the persistent widow in Luke chapter 18? A story there of a persistent widow. But this one is somebody comes at night 
Nobody wants to be bothered at night. And Jesus is telling us, even though people are not wa wanting to be bothered at night, you can still bother him anytime. Hallelujah. You can still call on the name of the Lord, and he's not bothered by your call. He's not bothered because you're calling him. I was listening to a song the other day, one of them African-American, uh, you know, those, he, those, uh, 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 they say black spiritual. I, I like the theology behind that. And they were singing a song about how God shows up at midnight. At midnight hour when everybody's sleeping. And then he went in that song, he talked about how when, uh, when the children of Israel were in Egypt and, and the angel of death was coming, it was at midnight that that happened, that the sons, the firstborns of Egypt, they all died because they couldn't apply the blood of the lamb by their doorpost. And then he talked about at midnight hour, the story of the ten virgins. How many of you remember that? Five were wise and five were foolish. It was at midnight hour that the bridegroom came. So a lot of things God do them at midnight hour. He's not bothered by it. <laughs> he can show up at midnight hour. It doesn't matter what time. And then the story of Paul and Silas. How many of you remember the story of Paul and Silas? They were in jail. And while they were in jail, I want you to hear this. They bound them and put shackles on their feet and locked them up because of the preaching of the word of God. And their situation was bad. And then, now of course this was not in the Bible, but in that song, that's why I like those songs. I, I, when, I look at, when I listen to it, I can visualize what was going on. So here is the situation. Paul and Silas, they were locked up and shackles on their feet, and they didn't know what to do. And many of us can be in a situation like this. But at least Paul had Silas. They can talk. And Silas said, Paul, what are we going to do? He said, I, Silas said, maybe we should sing a song and praise to God. He said, a good idea. And then Paul told Silas, Silas, let's wait until midnight hour. Because at midnight hour, now Paul is an experienced with being in jail. He knows all about jails. He's been he had all so many troubles where they threw him in jail. And this is what he said. Paul told Silas, Silas, wait at midnight hour. We will pray to God because at that time, all the jailers, they go to sleep. But we have a God who never sleeps. <laughs> and we can call him at midnight hour. He doesn't sleep. And at midnight hour, they start praising the Lord. And they call on the name of the Lord. And God appeared to them, and all the shackles on their feet was broken. And they were set free. I like those kind of stories. But I'm telling you, God is not bothered because you are calling on him. You may call Pastor David, maybe I'll feel bothered by your calls because I'm just Pastor David. I am weak. Your friends are weak. They may not come at the right time. But God, he can hear your prayers at any time. At any moment, you can call on the name of the Lord. Amen? And so I want to encourage us really to press in in prayers. And because our prayers are not being answered, we become discouraged. And we become discouraged, and there is nothing exciting about God anymore, and we don't pray, but we still go to church. We still attend church, but we doubt that God can answer prayers. And then we see other people probably see their prayers being answered, and we wish them well, but for us, we even doubt that God will actually answer 
our prayers. I wanted you to go back again to Mark chapter 11. I wanted to highlight something here that I believe could be the reason why. Have you ever asked that why are my prayers not being answered? There could be a reason, you know. Why? Why not me? Why is maybe somebody else? But I do believe this could be, I'm not saying it is the, uh, the ultimate answer to that, but there is one thing that we are missing. In verse 25 of Mark chapter 11, I wanted us to look at that, verse 25. We already read there in verse 24, I tell you, you can pray for anything. If you believe that you have received, it will be yours. Then Jesus goes on to say in verse 25, he said, but when you pray, when you are praying, first forgive. This is, this is the key. It says, when you are praying, first forgive anyone you're holding a grudge against. That could be what is holding our prayers and answered. We can pray all what we want, but if we are holding a grudge against somebody, our prayers will not be answered. In fact, the the Bible also teaches that if we, if you, a husband and wife, this is a very, very sensitive place in a relationship where if your relationship is not good, God will not hear your prayers. And, and uh, you know, you can pray all what you want, but God will not hear. So husbands are told, dwell with your wife in understanding. Dwell with her in understanding as a weaker vessel. It's a very controversial uh, scripture among theologians. What does it mean to be a weaker vessel? Have you ever asked that? It won't be a, in a world that we live in, this is not politically correct to call women a weaker vessel. Right? Well, why are you calling me a weaker vessel? And I was tell I, I was talking to Avnish. I said, you know, there are certain things that Nolan can get away. Nolan can't get away with it. There are certain things your hand can't get away with it. But Isaiah will, because I'll deal with Isaiah with the understanding that of his age. I shouldn't be harsh with him. There is an understanding. A weaker vessel, but co-heir. Co-heir means we are, when we stand before God, we are all the same. But he's talking about the place of authority. The man has authority in the home. He is the authority of that home. So the husband needs to understand and the wife needs to... We can get to that one day as God permits. But in a, in, a, in a marriage relationship, there is conflict there that could hinder your prayers. In a family, there could be conflicts that can hinder your prayers. Maybe you and your kids. There is one thing. Oh, thank you, Monday. I even didn't see that. I'm busy. Thank you, Monday. I wanted you to understand. My mother, she, I begin, now I know that she's, uh, she understands spiritual principles. The spiritual principles in our culture back in Africa that it was not because they learned from the Bible, but it is there. So when the missionaries came, it was very easy for the missionaries to reach our whole uh, our village. One of it is this. My older brother was sick. He was really sick. They went to the doctors. They tried all kinds of things. Nothing is happening. 
So my mom, just like, like uh, Marie, called the elders of the church. They called the elders of the church to come to our home. And my dad was put on a chair. And those elders there, man, when they call you, it's like you're going to be going to, uh, to the Hague or something to be interrogated. The Supreme Court, I mean, they sit there and you're put there and you have to testify. You have to honestly, out of your heart, speak why you hold grudge against your son. My dad was not happy with, the, with my older son because he was rebellious. He was causing a lot of havoc in the family and my dad was not happy with him. And that problem was not resolved. And so my mom's take on that, you may take however you want it, is that my dad's grudge towards my older brother was the reason maybe he's sick and he need to forgive him so that the church can pray for him so that he can be healed. Can you see that? And But in the world we live in, we, we, don't, we don't see these things yet. It's in the Bible. It's right here. And I thank God for my mom that as much as I think I'm a theologian or something, my mom knew what are the principles, spiritual principles of unforgiveness, what it can do, and holding somebody captive because you have grudge towards him can hinder your prayers. How many of you want your prayers answered? I want it. But... The, why we don't pray is because we don't see our prayers answered. But we ask the question, why is it that my prayers are not answered? And God is saying, yeah, but you know, you don't shake Monday's hand. <laughs> <laughs> so you can be in the same place in the church. And Monday comes like that. You come on the other. No, I don't think Monday. So he's a nice guy. But if prayers are not being answered, this could be the reason. This could be the reason. Unforgiveness, grudge, bitterness, all those kinds of things. And God looks at you and he said, now we can't blame God. He is not the reason why you're praising. Because you have those things that you're holding against somebody. But we're going to get rid of those things. Can somebody say amen? amen. Forgive. Like Joyce Myers, she said, do yourself a favor. Forgive. It is for your own benefit. It is for your own good. It is not for that person. It is for you. Do yourself a favor. Forgive. And so I believe that we want our prayers in our church to be answered. We want the overflow of the anointing of God. We want the breakthrough in our church. We want to see the sick people healed. We want to see deliverance in our church. I want to see that when we go, like we go downtown. Last week we went there and we evangelized there. We put all the music outside and we sang. We want to see there are Muslims there, there are Buddhists, there are people going all over, all kinds of people, that they can get saved. How about us actually casting out devils right there or lay our hands on the sick? And they get healed. But these things will not happen because we pray for it. And it won't happen because we have all the underlying things that are there that are affecting us. It makes us ineffective in the kingdom of God. And I, I'm tired of that. How many of you are tired of that? We don't want to be like that. God said he has given us everything that we need. So that we can overcome. Amen. Now sometimes. Our prayers are not answered. Because when we ask. <laughs> when we ask. We are not asking for the things. That are in line with the word of God. James chapter 4 verse 3. Warns us about asking. For the wrong things. For the wrong reasons. The amplified Bible said. The last line of the verse is, you do not have because you do not ask. Verse 3 then says, or you ask and yet fail to receive because you ask with wrong purpose. 
and evil, selfish motives. Your intention is to spend it on sensual, worldly pleasures. Right? We ask so that we can spend it for things that are not going to bear fruit. And so we are asking, and God will say, hey, I can't give it to you. Like at once I said, if I own a, a, a Ferrari or Lamborghini, a nice vehicle, can I give it to your hand? Maybe you can take Quincy for a ride or something. <laughs> no. Because I have to find out what happened to that Honda that he has. <laughs> you see, there's the issue of trust. Okay. Uh, so we trust God will give it to you. I'm bugging you. He's a good son. Yeah, he is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sometimes you get to meet other people that are worried about their sons, and you think yours is not good, and you say, thank God. <laughs> Mine is not going that far. He is good. Yeah. So you can give, I can give your hand that key, knowing that he's going to take care of that Lamborghini, and it will come back without dents. So the trust that God has, what are you, oh, he's going to use that so he can, go around and do other things with it. No, I'm not going to give it to him. God cannot give it to us. He cannot give, answer our prayers if he, because he knows all things. He knows your motives before you even think you wake up. He knows everything. So he cannot give it to you. So your motives have to be pure. Amen? Sometimes we ask for the wrong things instead of asking for the right things, especially money. You see, if you're asking for a car, maybe God will say, I'll give you a car. Because car, okay. But if for money, money can be used for all kinds of things. And God can't give it to you. God can't give it to you. Maybe that's why we need to watch what we are asking and whether it is right with God. I have some questions that I want to throw the, out there. What would... Be some proper request to bring to God in prayer. Salvation for family and friends. That to me, I always think about it. Salvation for family and friends. If you want to know the heart of God, what is it that God is pleased with? The Bible says, Enoch pleased God. God was so pleased with Enoch because Enoch was doing the right things. I, I do believe what are the right things? What are the things that make Jesus happy? And he will smile. He said, man, that church there at Wellsprings Victory Church, there they are again going to the streets of Regina and proclaiming the name, my name into the streets and bringing salvation to the city of Regina. They are doing a good job. My goodness, I can't help. Angel Gabriel, go down there to that, that church there and do this for them because they, their heart is right. They are doing the right thing. Salvation. They are concerned about their family. How can you have a family and not be concerned about their salvation? Think about it. Many people have family members that are not saved. When was the last time you prayed for them at least? Eh? Remember Job, how Job used to fast and pray for his own children. He repented for their sins that he even didn't know was there. Just in case. <laughs> Just in case. They've done some wicked things. Maybe they are watching some things they're doing. Well, Lord, I confess and I sacrifice for them. I pray for them. Eh? Crying for the city of Regina as if their sins are your own sins. Weeping for your family and crying for them. For them to be saved. Salvation. That is who Jesus is. He didn't have to come and die for something that is not his own problems. But yet he came and died for you. Salvation of your family. 
If you begin to do, you cry out for them. You pray for your neighbors. And then after you pray. Oh, I've prayed long enough. Because we can hide in prayer. We can hide in the closet room. Get up. God told Joshua, get up. He was kneeling down and praying. Because they went to the city of Ai and they got beat up. After winning the battle in Jericho, they are going to a small city, just like Bell Plain. <laughs> and they got beat up. And he was asking, why? Why did we get beat up by a small group of people and last week we won a big battle? That's a good question. How come last week God answered my prayer? Now I pray, I pray, nothing is happening. I should examine myself and see maybe I'm not, maybe I'm, I'm angry with somebody and, and I need to forgive so that I will be, have an open heaven so that God will answer my prayers. So whatever I ask, it shall be done. Unforgiveness is a very wicked spirit that the enemy uses to stop us from receiving from God. Salvation for your family is a top priority. Isn't that true? You don't want to go to heaven only to find out that you're the only one that get got there and your whole family is perishing. Your friends are perishing. And you've never told them. You've never invited them. You've never prayed for them. Hey, God answer prayers, right? And this is a priority. When it comes to God, this is a priority. For God so loved the world that he sent his son. So he loves your family. And you need to make it a priority to pray for them, for your friends. Daily necessities, including food and transportation. Good job. Oh, thank you, Lord, for good job for my daughter. Hallelujah. I begin to really feel worried there. Because I want her to get a job. Nowadays, getting a job is not easy, guys. Just about two years ago, people begged you, do you have anybody? Now, no. Now they tell you, you apply online. And please don't call us. If we don't call you, it's over. Just stay there. So you send resumes, no phone call. Even getting a phone call will excite you. <laughs> <laughs> so we're getting to that place. And I'm telling you, who knows? Maybe it'll get worse. But we have to pray for these things, right? What about praying for your food? Hey? Eh? Praying, Lord, bless my food. You don't know what kind of food nowadays. I was actually shocked just about a year or two ago. I've never heard of anything like that. Well, we went to a Christmas uh, celebration at Harvest City where for teachers and something like that. And there is one row. This is um, food for this kind of people. What do you call it? Gluten-free, that's the line there. And the rest of the people, they say, I say, what, what is that? What, what exactly? <laughs> that's for certain kinds of, if you eat that, something will happen to you. What it is, I don't know. But I'm telling you, food is being depleted in the world today. All kinds of chemicals that are being used. And one day you will not even know if you should buy something because all the crops that are out there the original ones are being depleted. They all become organic, uh, what do you call them? Genetically modified food. And we don't know. They never experiment on it to see if it works except on you. And the consequences of it. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's the world we are living in. Remember, God blessed the children of Israel so that the food they ate they were never sick. Their clothes never wore out. Their shoes never wear out. God can do that to you here in Regina. You may be eating what you don't know what you're eating. But because you bless that food, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus, my food is blessed. My family is blessed. My water is blessed. 
See, we have to pray, guys. If there are people that need to pray more, so it is now. In our time, in our day, we need to pray. You need to bless your food. Pray for it. Hallelujah. Good job, nice income, health, spiritual gifts. Question number two, can you tell of a time recently that you asked God for one of these things mentioned and he provided? Can you remember? You ask God for salvation. You ask God, if not, why not? Or you pray for your food. See, we take it for granted. We take it for granted. Another thing is, we, we always think, you know, when I got on the plane, I was going to the Sudan. Now, I have to tell you this. <laughs> there was one place we were drinking water from that probably... That time there was a, people are running away from the military and there was guns being fired. Was kind of like probably is cleaning. But that's the only one you're going, there's nothing else. That's it, that's what you're gonna get. I remember that years ago when I was a little kid. And I'm here, God took care of me. And then when we went recently, me and Johan and we went there and by the Lake Victoria there, we're going on the Nile, and the water looks very clean. That is, the, it's a running water. I looked at it, and, and I thought about it, but we all have bottles in our hands, filtered water, to make sure we're not going to get hurt. We're so careful. Oh, see? But I'm telling you, even right here, you don't know what you're eating. The vegetables you're eating, you don't know what kind of things are in there. And you have to trust God. We have to trust God. We have to get to the place of praying for the simple little things. That little things, pray, bless God. Wake up, you pray, God, thank you for the food I'm eating. Thank you for my family. You can even pray in advance before you get on that table that whatever food you're eating is blessed, the water is blessed. Maybe it is genetically modified, but it's blessed in Jesus' name. It's blessed in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder. God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. First faith, we must believe. He is God all in all. He rewards stickability and faithfulness. If you stick there, if you stay there, he will bless that. What does this passage then mean to you and how you would encourage uh, that you encourage us to depend on these promises? When we stand on these promises, number four, you have something this moment that you need God to supply. All of us came here because we are in need. What is your need? There is no small need that you have that God will not answer. And today, I wanted to give you the opportunity to really come to God and in faith ask. We're going to take the moment to ask God because I wanted God, just like our sister Marie came and said, Pastor David, I have a need. I need prayer. You can ask God for your needs. Whatever the needs are, God is able. It doesn't have to become worse before you can ask for it. It may not be as difficult. It can be something that you can live with it. But the, I, I remember that scripture in Proverbs. It says, it is the little foxes 
I spoil the vineyard. We always think it has to be a big thing. <laughs> but it is those little, little foxes that spoils the vineyard, not the big ones. One day I came to Dr. George. I said, Dr. George, yeah, we got that building there uh, at, on Cameron Street. We are going to buy it. I said, this is a small, a small problem for us. Just like David killed Goliath, that will be to us like a little bunny. And we will just get it. It's easy. He said, David, don't see the bunny like that. He said, he's little, but he's fast. <laughs> when he runs, it's not easy to catch. And I learned something. Say, yeah, that's true. He said, David, the, the same thing. If you're facing Goliath or you're facing a little bunny, it is the same spiritual principles that you need to apply. The little bunny can outrun you. You can run out of breath trying to catch that bunny. How many of you caught a bunny before? Victory said he did. <laughs> no, you lift your hand. I said, <laughs> they are fast. I had some in my backyard. They even had little ones there. But when we get there, they're gone. They're not friendly. I, I thought maybe we can play with them a little bit. But they're fast. So God is telling us this morning, what are your needs? He wanted to answer. If you have a need, Brother Charles, I'm going to ask. If you can come. Brother Monday. Come, you and your, you and your wife, uh, Charles, Marie's not here today, is she? Yeah. Avnish and Seema, and we're going to pray, hallelujah. If you have a need, I wanted you to come and just approach them and say, hey, this is my need. Can you agree with me in prayer? And I'll ask the worship team to come, and we will just, you can play some music for us. We're just going to stay there in prayer. If you want to go, you can go. Why not we all stand? Hallelujah.